We read from the Word of God as we find it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31. So directly following the words that we read as a summary of the law, these. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel, and he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. He will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them. Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon, and to Og, kings and the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not nor be afraid of them. For the Lord, thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests and the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place where he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and a pillar of cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And Jehovah and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go in among, to be among them and will forsake me, and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day from all, for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that they turned unto other gods. Now therefore, write ye this song for you. And we're going to have a couple more references to this song. But the content of the song, the song itself, is what you find in the next chapter. From verse 1. To almost to the end is the song that he's going to write. So now therefore write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that, they, that this song may be a witness for the 
for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles have, are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it, shall be, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about even now before I brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song in the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them and will be with thee. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in the book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death ye will corrupt, utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because ye do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So far we read, may God bless this word. Our text for this morning, the first day of a new calendar year and a decade, is the sixth verse. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Moses has made it clear that these are the last words. The whole of this book of Deuteronomy is Moses' final concluding speech to the children of Israel. In chapter 34, verse 5, he died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and God buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. His departure was reason for great sorrow. Chapter 34, verse 8 says that the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. But that created concern and alarm in the minds of many of the children of Israel. Alarm about how it was going to go in the future. Often when we look ahead, that concern can be for us as well. Knowing how weak we are, we may wonder how we're going to cope. We may wonder how our teenagers are going to do, how our children will do. And notice that this song, he wants to be taught to the children. And even if they don't understand all the words, but they've got the song with the music going in their heads, that song will then come to mean something to them later in their life. That's, 
that's exactly how God put it. They didn't see the deliverance out of Egypt. They didn't see how God cared for them in, in the wilderness. So put the words of this song before them. Do you know, did you count how many times God said, be strong and of a good courage in this chapter alone? Three times. First in verse 6, then in verse 8, and then again in verse 23. And if I turn over a few pages to Joshua 1, if you have the Bible open before you, take a quick peek. Joshua 1, God is addressing Moses after the death of Joshua, after the death of Moses. He's addressing Joshua after the death of Moses. Look at verse 6, how it starts. Be strong and of a good courage. Look at verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Look at verse 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Six times. Be strong and of a good courage. These are God's words in a very frightening situation. So from the perspective of Israel and Joshua, it was the frightening outlook. But then God brings an assured reality, and that is that he is with them and goes before them. And then we have that confident strength so that we can heed the command, be strong and of good courage. But let's first look at the outlook that's a setting before the children of Israel. They had, from a human perspective, all kinds of reasons to be afraid. First, they had to go over a swollen river as a nation. The two spies would be able to do that at the ford, but to have the whole nation go over And as soon as they got over, all of the people who were born in the wilderness, so that everybody 38 years and under, had not been circumcised. They're going to have a circumcision. The men of Shechem could not fight when they were circumcised for several days, if not weeks. Every man who was born in the wilderness had to be circumcised. After they got over the Jordan River, right in the face of all of those nations that were all stronger and mightier than they. They faced giants. They faced high-walled cities. They faced Every nation, each of the different nations, God tells us, was stronger and mightier than Israel. Even if they had close to almost two million people, every other nation was stronger and mightier. Every other nation had chariots and horses. God commanded Israel, you may not have chariots and you may not have horses. You have to fight on foot. The other nations had them. They were going to be facing a people who were going to be desperate. And in their desperation, were going to be stronger and mightier and fiercer. Because just as the devil knows that his time is done and he's got a short while and he increases his energy and efforts, so the people of, of the land of Canaan echoed and reflected in the thought of those who were in Jericho. As Rahab related it, they were all terrified. And that made them extra desperate in their battle. That's the kind of people they had to face. And they're going forward now, 
second reason for fear. With an untried leader, the only leader they've ever known was Moses. And Moses wasn't just a leader. Moses was the one, if you look at the end of Deuteronomy 5, who represented God. They, they said, we're scared of God talking to us. So Moses was the one who heard from God and then directly brought God's word to them. Now he was gone. There was no way to know whether God would do that through Joshua. He did not. There was no prophet like unto Moses. He represented God. He's going to be gone. He's not going to be there. And then the third reason for fear is why was Moses not going to take them into the land of Canaan? Because one time he disobeyed God. And the justice of God demanded correctly, accurately, that he be punished and not be allowed to go into the land of Canaan, the picture of heaven. If Moses, if the justice of God is such that Moses was not allowed, how were they going to be? Especially now when you read the rest of this chapter and God tells them what they're going to do, how they're going to fall away. And they knew their weakness. They knew they were quick to complain. They knew they, were, they just had the experience at Baal Peor. The temptations were fierce. They gave in to them quickly. How could they stand? The church today can also have reason to be afraid. There are many parts of the church that we don't experience what they experience, and that is fierce persecution. Here in America, we're, I think we would be surprised how little religious knowledge there is of the one true God, even in the other parts of Western civilization. And if they know God, and they may think about Jesus Christ, their understanding of God is so distorted that they think he can't control evil. And when bad things and really hard and bad things happen to us, they have reason to leave religion and to relieve the belief in God. Because God is good. He wouldn't do that. Their knowledge of God is greatly confused. In the midst of this climate in the world today, a world that is becoming ever increasingly evil and openly so, the church has to exist. We fight not against flesh and blood. It's not just other people who don't believe. It's principalities and powers in the dominion of Satan. The temptations that they set before us in an alluring way are greater than what the children of Israel faced from Midian and Moab at Baal Peor. You don't have to have other people come in. You just can use your phone. And it's not just pornography. It's all kinds of evils that are right there in access, quietly, under the sheets in a closed door bedroom or in your car. And then, and we're not that strong. 
We are prone by nature to every sin. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to say that. We want to think we're stronger. But we aren't. There's no sin that any one of us would not be able to commit given the circumstances. The allurements and then there's then there's the fighting, the arguing, the controversy, even inside of our own denomination. Are we able to remain faithful? There's active suspicions about leaders. Can't be sure about the professors. Will our children remain faithful? Are we able to stand? How can we be sure when the pressure mounts? There's reason for fear. A fool says we don't. With that frightening outlook, we look at what our God says to us. Jehovah, thy God. Once again, don't lose the beauty and the power of those three simple words. He's Jehovah. So they may be losing Moses, and he won't be there anymore. But God replaces Moses with Joshua. Eighth and ninth graders. We just had the name Joshua. That's the Hebrew. What's the Greek word for Joshua? Jesus. What do both words mean? Jehovah saves. Jehovah salvation. He would be their leader. And he is Emmanuel. And then Jehovah the self-sustaining one, the self-sufficient one, the independent one. He is thy God. He's established that relationship. So he identifies himself as yours and you as his. Know ye that he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people. If we're his people, he's our God. We are his sheep. He's our shepherd. He makes us not look at the circumstances, not even look at all of our weaknesses. He wants us to know our weakness because when we're weak, then we know where to look. Then we're strong because we look away from ourselves. But Jehovah, our God, says, look up. So that's why the appropriateness last night. Be still. Would you stop a minute and you're racing through life? Would you be still and know, I am God. I am your God. I'm yours. I've made you mine and myself to be yours. And I promise to go with you. With us, with our children, with our little ones, with our teenagers, right with them next to them, beside them, above them, behind them, in them, is that self-sufficient, 
self-existent, independent God who says, I have a relationship with them. I go with them. And I, above all things, control everything. I control all things. That's the reason why we sang from Psalm 33, 85, the last stanza. He speaks and it was done. The God who created simply by speaking is the one who is with all of us. Our children too. He's almighty. He's God. The emphasis of the word God. That being who is every perfection. But most emphatically, he's the almighty one. If our enemies have any power, it is because of what God is giving to them and working through them. They're not aware of it. They claim it for themselves. But it's God's power. It's God's might. God is the almighty and then when he says, I am your God, that's Emmanuel. I go with you. God with us. I think sometimes I need just that word Emmanuel imprinted before my mind all the time. God with me, God with man, God with us. Then he says, I will not fail you nor forsake you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. When he puts it that way, then it's obvious that he says that over against the way in which everything in which man puts their trust fails. You put your trust in a rising economy in 2020? Do you put your trust in horses and chariots? Do you put your trust that America has got the secret weapons to be able to handle anything that others would have when they attack the United States? Do you put your trust in your wits, in your strength? God makes it clear that when we put our trust in something other than God, we have made an idol. Read the Heidelberg Catechism on Lord's Day 1. If Sue puts her trust in Ron, she's got an idol. He's going to fail. He has. There's only one who will not fail and who will not leave, forsake. Now, all the things that God says about the troubles and the trials that he will bring to them, both at the end of this chapter and in the song, all those troubles and trials, understand that they are under the umbrella of this. I will not leave you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. The troubles that God gives are the exercises of that, I'm not going to leave you. Because you have left me, I want you to realize, and I'm going to make it kind of hard on you, so that you realize what leaving me does. But it's because I love you that I'm going to make you feel that. If I didn't care about you, I'd let you go. Then I wouldn't chastise you. But I make you pause and stop. And maybe it takes a lot of them before you pause and stop and reflect and look at me, I don't fail you. It may appear that I failed you. When the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, don't forget, we know the whole story, so we kind of forget how terrifying it had to be when they went on the wrong side of the Red Sea, had mountains in front of them suddenly, and mountains on the east of them, sea on the left, 
And then they see the cloud of the mightiest empire's army of that day. Here comes the dust. Here they come. And they're a nation of slaves. They thought they were done. When they went into captivity in Babylon, we know how 70 years it's going to be finished. When they went in, they may have had some prophecies of 70 years that the real faithful and godly ones kept in mind. He kept saying, but for the most part, you know how many deaths they saw and they experienced ravaged with a military army that just slaughtered? And then they went dragging themselves to the land of Babylon. No temple, no way of worshiping God with the Ark of the Covenant or with the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings. None of that. Without it. All that they could do was pray in the direction of Jerusalem. They thought God had forsaken. Now we know the history. But do you know how many times it is that God's children today get really down? Depressed, discouraged, frightened, despairing. Yeah, we know the Bible, but we still find ourselves at the bottom. And our covenant God comes over and over and over. And he says in various ways, you're going to have evil. But your understanding of that trouble is that either I will avert it, and if I don't avert it, I'm going to turn it for your profit. Every time we read the baptism form, that's what it means when we are baptized in the name of the Father. I will either avert evil or turn it to your profit. And he says, fear not. It hurts. It's hard. But God makes it simple. And sometimes in those deep pits... To have him just simply say, I am with you. I will not fail you. I am not failing you. Look at me. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at your trials. Don't look at the circumstances. Look up at me. They looked at the river. They looked at the high-walled cities. They looked at a nation that was desperate. And God not only said, I am with you, I will not fail you, but then he added, I will go before you. I promise to go before you. He says that in verse 8. He said it in verse 3. I will go in front of you. I will be in the front line of the battle. My face will be toward the enemies. You will be behind me. Though your enemies are a trillion trillion, though their principalities and powers, though it's Antichrist, my name is Emmanuel. I am with you, and I will clear the way. You know what he did? He came into the likeness of our flesh. He so identified himself that he went through every kind of experience that we go through. He didn't sin, but he went through every experience. He knew death of a loved one. 
He wept. He knew pain. He knew what it was to be reviled. He knew what it was to be called out of his mind by his own brothers. They thought he was really special. He disgusted them. He knew what it was to be denied and betrayed by those who loved him. And that was his going before us on the front line. And he went where we'll never go. He went to hell. He knew what we never knew, God's anger. The judgment that God must execute for our sin. So Moses was not allowed to go into that land flowing with milk and honey. But God buried him. And God took him home. God didn't let the picture deny the reality. Sure, he didn't go into the picture land, but he had the reality. And God watched over him by taking the punishment for every sin. The devil loves to shout and then to whisper, you were naughty, that's why you're being punished. That's why things aren't working out. That's why you've got these physical problems. That's why you've got these economical problems. That's why you've got these emotional problems, because you're a sinner. I'm a sinner, but I'm never being punished by the wrath of God, ever. Jesus was in the front line, and he took it all. He not only entered into the grave, but he exited. He went all the way to hell, and he came out. And he said, it is finished. God went before us in the son of his love, and he took away everything that would bar us and keep us from going to heaven. He opened the way, in fact. He not only took everything away, he opened the path so that death has no sting. He did avert evil. And he did work everything for the profit of his children. So if you want to think, imagine it, then Jesus is in the front line of the battle. That's where you put the strongest and the most capable soldiers. Jesus is right there. We're, we're, we're behind him. We're not even next to him. We're behind him. And as his face faces the enemy... It's not that he's helmeted and he's shielded and he's equipped with every secret weapon that can just zap him. No, you know how he's there before them? Just as he was on the cross, naked. His arms stretched, hanging. That's how he was before us. Because that's the power of the word of God. Again, Psalm 33, he spake and he created. He commanded and it stood fast. That word is the sword out of the mouth of our Savior. He consumes them with the breath of his mouth. So when Jesus had to face the devil and the temptations, starving, Drained, how did he answer? How did he fend? How did he defeat the devil? And every time he spoke from the word of God, the breath of God's mouth, Jesus is that breath. Our defense and our offense is the word. So we may know this. Now, this is what faith does. Faith says, we face a fierce foe. But faith says that fierce foe is not just 
wounded, and he's not just defeated, he is dead. He is conquered. He's not just weakened. He's destroyed. And that makes us more than conquerors. Why? Because we're so strong? No. It's not about us. We're so strong and we are more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. He's never going to stop. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. So we face a foe, not just weakened, but defeated. But we face, we still fight, we still must obey. It's not done. We don't just sit and do nothing. We fight. We obey. Read those last words again of Deuteronomy 30. We do that by loving him back in return. That's true obedience. Do everything out of love. He gifts us with that ability to love him. He gifts us with the ability to obey him. He gifts us with the faith that makes us fight against the old man and, and says no to the allurements of this world. He gifts us with that, but it's the way of our actively performing those activities of loving, obeying, fighting that we consciously experience. We're more than a conqueror. I am a victor in Christ. Now, it's with that enemy and with that confidence that God says how many times, be strong and of a good courage. Be strong is to stand firm in the face of opposition. Ephesians 6, all it says is stand just stand, be strong, stand firm. To be of good courage is to remain strong and solid when battered. To remain firm with a boldness, even when battered. Now, a couple of things about this command that God issues. Be strong and of good courage. One, when God does this, he does it compassionately. He does it sympathetically because he knows our weakness. One of the less known verses of familiar Psalm 103 is, he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. So that's why he says to us, be strong. So one, he comes to us with that word of command compassionately. Number two, he comes to us with that command. And a command from God implies that when we don't do what he commands us to do, we're sinning. When we're frightened, when we despair, when we panic. But now three. Compassionately, with a command. But now, who's issuing the command? Now, two quick verses. Just as God commanded in creating, and it stood fast, and just as he is still all spe now speaking, and everything continues to exist. You look around you. There is not a thing that you can see around you or in you that God is not speaking right now, and the nature of his speech is it keeps it in existence. That's the God who's issuing this command. 
Be strong and of good courage. God's word of command is effectual. It's not our commands or a general in an army's command. This is the command of God. Listen to how Ezekiel 24, 14 puts it. You might want to remember Ezekiel 24, 14. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. Look at there. I command it. It'll come to pass. I do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to thy ways and according to thy doings shall they judge thee, saith the Lord Jehovah. I command, and it comes to pass, and I do it. Because the power of God's word is that it doesn't create conditions in our lives, but rather is exactly the way that God's spirit works within us. We said that a couple weeks ago. He issues a command, but with every command, he says, I love you. And he wins us by the power of that work, pointing us to the cross, showing and demonstrating his love so that he works within us so that we want to obey. And we don't look at it as something grievous, I have to do it, but we delight to do it because that's how we say back to him, I love you too. When we obey what he commands. So he's working it in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The gospel is how he saves. It's called in Romans 1, the power of salvation. It's the power that opens the eyes of the blind. The preaching of the gospel is exactly the power and the wisdom of God to save. And that's how he works. So he issues a command. Be strong and of good courage. I know you're weak. I remember. So that's why I tell you. I issue it as a command so you know this is what you must do. I do it because I can make it happen by speaking. So we may be assured of the victory. We're going to do that in the way of knowing his speech, his word. If we don't hear it, and if we don't read it, then we're going to become weak spiritually. So that's why put this song in their minds and in their memories. Have them sing this song over and over and over. Learn that God became man in, as the expression of God's unfathomable love. Learn of the righteousness that Christ merited for us and he imputes to our account so that God looks at you as holy and righteous. Learn of him who says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So 2020 has all kinds of things we don't know are going to happen. But as we go forward in 2020, meditating on the word of God day and night, Psalm 1, when God says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage, he accompanies that with obey me, obey my word, keep my commandments, keep my promises, know what they're there, and then be assured that whithersoever thou goest, I will be with you. That's Joshua 1, 9. Matthew 28, 20. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. And then he concludes, I go with you, even to the end of the age. Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? The strength that we have is Christ's work. What's the helmet? Salvation Christ earned. What's the breastplate? The righteousness that he's imputed to us. What's the girdle and the shoes? It's the good news. God is God. 
and he goes with us, and he will not fail us. And that's why 1 John 5, verse 4, faith, to hold for truth what God has revealed, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Bless thy word, Father. Thy word that makes us look at thee. Thy word that makes us look up. Thy word that assures us we're cared for, we're protected, we're guarded. Help us to see that reality. The pressures are to look elsewhere. May we know where to look and know that thou art God, our God. For Jesus' sake, amen.